Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy and on today's show my guest has 25 years plus experience in Washington DC in public relations, communications and issue advocacy. He is also the founder of Solve Advocacy and currently the press and media strategy consultant to the new Paradigm Institute. Love to welcome Kevin Wright to the podcast. Thank you Andy, I appreciate you having me on. Good to have you on, Kevin. And before we discuss the events of October 20th and the new Paradigm Institute's Global Disclosure Day, a huge live stream event, I want to find out a little bit more about you yourself first. For any listeners who may be unfamiliar, what's your background and what's brought you to the the UFO conversation? Sure. Well, you know, like you said, uh, to introduce me, I've been working in Washington, D.C. for the better part of 25 years or so. Um, you know, working in politics, uh, doing research, communications, um, you know, working on issue advocacy campaigns, grassroots campaigns. And, you know, it, it, about 2017, 2018, you know, I was starting to get really sort of just burned out on all the partisan politics and all the things going on in Washington, D.C. And um, started getting interested in, in other subject matters, uh, beginning with, you know, sort of consciousness and afterlife studies. And the more I sort of started going down those rabbit holes, uh, it became much more clear from some of the people that have been studying those issues that there could be a correlation between those issues and UFOs, UAP. And so um, I figured that without having sort of an academic degree behind me, you know, in some sort of uh, edge science studies, it would be easier to sort of start, you know, looking into the, the UFO subject uh, in, in a much more credible and, and easy way. And once I started doing that, you know, it became clear to me that, um, you know, post the December 2017 article in New York Times and, you know, listening to other people on podcasts and reading, you know, numerous books, that it became clear that there was a there there. Um, and now, you know, as I've progressed, you know, seven years or so into this, um, you know, I, I kind of think that when Carl Nell says there's zero doubt, and, you know, Lou Elizondo says, you know, they're here, you know, I think that's true. Um, so that's sort of brought me here in trying to figure out ways that I can contribute to the discussion towards government transparency, towards the disclosure process uh, by bringing, you know, the skills and expertise that I've developed over the last 25 years, you know, to this subject matter, because it's something that's been largely uh, absent from the field until the last couple of years. Obviously, there was, you know, some, some big name advocates uh, over the last 20 years, you know, the Stephen Greer's, of course, and then there's been, you know, uh, Stephen Bissett, uh, re- you know, the first lobbyist um, to register on the UFO UAP issue. So um, it's not entirely breaking new ground, but no one has really sort of started to implement, you know, grassroots organizing, trying to build, uh, you know, grassroots organizations across the United States uh, to sort of try to make this into a political issue that the politicians will have to, you know, take account for. They'll no longer be able to just sort of sweep it under the rug and, uh, you know, pay attention to it. Yeah, and we'll come back to discuss Citizens for Disclosure and, and what that's starting to look like as well. But your own interest, does that go back to childhood or was it the 2017 article that really got you looking into the UFO topic? Well, you know, I, I'm 48, so, I, you know, I kind of grew up on X-Files and things like that. So it was always a subject matter that was of interest, but it was not something that I really paid you know, a great deal of attention to. Um, strangely enough, I was actually in Phoenix, uh, March of 1997, I was getting ready to transfer to Arizona state university. So I went there with my parents, um, we were staying at a hotel and we were just sitting out one evening and, uh, you know, looked up and saw the Phoenix lights. Um, but even then it wasn't something that was stayed sort of at the forefront of my mind or anything like that. It was just something that was like, huh, that's, you know, really kind of weird. Um, but then again, it wasn't again until, you know, 2017 or a little bit later that, you know, it sort of started creeping more into my mind that, you know, Hey, I did see that. And, you know, there's gotta be something more to this. Were the Phoenix lights, what exactly did you see? If you don't mind me just asking for, for a bit more detail, like. Sure. So we were, um, I forget the exact name location. I think it's called like Awatuki foothills area. Um, looking out over Phoenix and we were just sitting there, you know, sort of by the pool after dinner that evening and, uh, you know, saw these lights that came through and over, uh, you know, this, this sort of mountain range, I don't remember what it's called now, um, Awatuki foothills, but, um, you know, it was unmistakable that it was not, you know, it wasn't a plane, you know, it was, 
you know, a series of lights and it was very large. Um, you know, it was inexplicable. And, you know, we commented to ourselves that, you know, it's probably UFO or something. But like I said, it wasn't something that we really gave much thought to. It's funny how often and people get in touch with me and say they've they've never had their own sighting. They would love to. And I think sometimes folks can struggle with the idea that you can see something pretty spectacular with even a group of people. And in the moment, you, you don't treat it almost as seriously as you think you would or right. in the way you think you would. And I've said that about my own sighting when I was younger with, with kind of four other people. It's like, oh, wow, isn't that interesting? And then you go on with your day, your your evening, your night, and your life, and it can almost just become an afterthought. So um, not surprised with the kind of reaction and whatnot. But yeah, that pretty cool event to be a part of. And one of those I just wish happened 10, 10 15 years later when we all had camera phones and whatnot. But yeah. Right. Well, like I said, you know, it wasn't something until much later where you realized sort of the significance of that event, you know, and then saying, well, you know, geez, I was kind of there for it, um, even though at the time it didn't register as something significant. Um, solve advocacy. Let's talk about that. So this is your site and your your passion project, your work. What is it, and, and what's it accomplishing? So what I did was I, you know, I've taken my experience of things and I set up a consulting firm to help people uh, and organizations sort of figure out how to communicate to the public and to elected officials about this issue. You know, um, I also do. Uh, I'm a board advisor to the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. So they write a lot of technical papers and you have to try to figure out how, you know, in a press release, you're going to put it out. So, um, you know, people are aware of the paper and things. You'll, so you have to also be able to sort of explain what the findings and the purpose of the paper are without getting into sort of all the scientific jargon that would just go over the top of people's heads. So, you know, that's part of it. And then part of it is, um, you know, I've done a lot of pro bono work with people like uh, Randall Nickerson, who did the Aerial Phenomenon movie. You know, trying to get a little more publicity and public relations around his film and his screenings. Um, you know, also doing issue advocacy, which is primarily done with uh, New Paradigm Institute. You know, going to Capitol Hill, uh, meeting with members of Congress and their staff, and trying to you know raise the awareness uh, on Capitol Hill about this issue. It's also about you know um, mobilize, educating, and mobilizing the public. You know that they're uh, you know that the UFO UAP is a reality um, and try to make them understand how, you know, it is important for them to, you know, advocate for the truth and how it may affect them, impact them. Um, so it encompasses a lot of different aspects of, you know, same thing of, you know, transparency and disclosure process. I think if I'm not mistaken, SCU, and I've hosted a few folks from SCU over the years, have just in the last few minutes released a new paper as well. Um, That's right. Literally, literally, as I was, I was going back and forward. Um, I think the title of it or the the subject is about how far are we away from catastrophic disclosure? Is it Matthew? Yeah, actually, I, yeah I actually did the tweet for that. But um, yeah, it's Professor Matthew Sedegas. Yeah. It's called "How much time do we have before catastrophic disclosure occurs?" And so what he did was he, you know, he sort of uh, calculated the probability of you know everybody now having cell phones and camera phones and. You know, uh, so uh, it's a very interesting paper. It's it's not extremely long, so it wouldn't take very long to read it. So I'd encourage uh, all of your listeners and, and watchers to, you know, to check it out because it's very interesting. Definitely, folks. And like I say, it literally has come out in a few minutes before I hit record. So I've not even yeah. had the chance myself to, to get to that. But I thought it'd be worth people knowing. Definitely check that one out. And I'll put the link for it in the description as well. So, Kevin, um. We're recording this on, it is Monday the 21st of October. Yep. Yesterday on the 20th of October, the New Paradigm Institute had uh, its Global Disclosure Day. For anyone who hasn't heard yet, um, I hosted Jim Garrison, who is head of the New Paradigm Institute's Washington office, yep. just a few days ago discussing the event. It was going to be a two-hour live stream. It's turned into a, over a three-hour live stream, which right. I believe is still being edited down uh, and, and kind of cleaned up and whatnot. So that's due back out very, very soon. Um, do you want to fill folks in, though, who may be unfamiliar with what it was, who didn't catch that, as to what the event was and include your own role within that? Sure. So the Global Dis Disclosure Day was sort of born out of uh, some meetings that were occurring um, with Citizens for Disclosure and coming up with ideas for, you know, sort of um, bringing greater awareness to, you know, the disclosure process. And so the Global Disclosure Day was sort of born out of that. And uh, the idea was to, you know, bring in a lot of different speakers who are, 
you know, intimately involved in the process, whether from a reporting angle, like, you know, Ross Coulthart to, um, you know, Lou Elizondo and his role uh, with previous investigations at UAP, uh, Carl Nell, you know, of course, Danny Sheehan and his longtime involvement in the subject. And then also bring in some other people that, you know, uh, other people are not necessarily familiar with. And then also show that there is, you know, a growing movement, not just here in the United States, but around the world where, you know, people are organizing and educating the public and their politicians to the reality of UAP and then, you know, fighting for greater, greater government transparency and, uh, you know, just disclosure. And within that, what was your particular role around it? Uh, so my role is pretty, uh, you know, small by comparison to Jim uh, Garrison and Katie Amron and others who were really, uh, you know, put their shoulders behind the wheel and, and, you know, really made that day happen. You know, I helped organize a few of the speakers and then I did, you know, some of the press relations around it, you know, press release and that sort of thing. But Jim Garrison, you know, deserves, you know, so much credit for putting that day together. You know, it was his uh, project for the last four or five weeks. And, um, you know, they really did a good job with it. And it really was. I think Jim stressed a few times on there that it has been a brainchild of around five weeks from inception to, that's right. to putting that on. So that's certainly to be commended as well. We're speaking hours after the event here, essentially, and you're still getting a lot of data and opinion and whatnot coming in. But how, how do you feel it's landed so far? I think uh, so far from what I've seen, I haven't been monitoring social media that much, but um, you know, all the feedback that, that I've received, um, has been very positive, people happy with the, um, you know, with the speaker lineup with the diversity of thought. Um, you know, I think the criticism that we've heard the most is probably that it went on a little too long. Um, but you know, it's kind of hard to, uh, rein people in when you're live, uh, and talking. And so, um, you know, that's something we'll probably take into consideration the next time that we do an event to, you know, better map out time frame in which it will occur in. Some of the big positive takeaways immediately, and I think while it was happening still, um, very early on, I suppose it's fair to say you brought out the big hitters and the big names right at the beginning. So yeah. you have your Ross Coulterts, Carl Nell, Luis Elizondo, Danny Sheehan, a um, couple of comments that really seemed to, to get the conversation going. Ross Coulter saying the US government is actively shooting down UAP and retrieving them. And Danny discussing exact locations of potential bases underwater or underneath the oceans, potentially. Do you want to just chat around that and those kind of bombshells? Well, um, well, I can't speak to, you know, their comments specifically because I don't have the information that they're, you know, privy to. But um, clearly there was some, you know, news made yesterday, um, you know, uh, Coltart, obviously, Danny Sheehan, uh, you know, Carl Nell, um, I think, you know, also, there was some news made between, you know, a partnership that's being uh, strategically built between NPI and MUFON to, you know, start coordinating some of the aspects of the organizations together to, you know, um, enhance some of the, um, you know, the programs that both are engaged in. So I think there was a lot of news that came out of yesterday's uh, Global Disclosure Day, um, you know, some more surprising than others, I suppose, but um, you know, very interesting. And I think that, uh, you know, it shows that there was, you know, a sizable audience paying attention and uh, actively engaged in, you know, the discussion. So you touch on the the broad audience, and I think this was maybe not exclusive to Global Disclosure Day, but there's an element of the UFO conversation I think that's very difficult to nail because there is such a broad audience for the UFO topic that there's very, very different types of people who are interested in the topic. And that's evident by, you know, the list of speakers that were on the day. And if you look at any major UFO conference that happens in the US, even like a contact in the desert, for example, there's such a range of names discussing such a range of, of ideas. And it can range from people being extremely interested in a few, not interested at all in a whole host of others and downright objecting against you know a few names as well depending on where you fall on the ufo conversation so how difficult is that to to look at such a divisive conversation as the ufo topic bring together a host of names but try and land a consistent message so you know you're right there is a very uh wide array and 
deep, diverse uh, field of thought on the UFO subject matter. There's also, a, you know, the same goes for transparency and, and, and disclosure. Um, it is difficult to sort of uh, be able to speak to an audience while presenting all those different uh, thoughts and opinions. Um, so we did, we just truly tried to, to focus people on, you know, sort of one aspect of what we're talking about, which is, you know, the, the advocacy for disclosure, for, you know, the need for people to sort of get involved. Um, and, you know, because we, it's our opinion that without, you know, a, a public citizenry that's, that's engaged in this process, that disclosure is not likely to happen unless it's the variety of, of catastrophic or something. So that was really sort of part of the theme of the day. And I think people did a pretty good job of sticking to that and not, um, you know, trying to inject too many different hypotheses or thought processes into, you know, the narrative of the day, but really sort of sticking to what our common purpose was, which was to bring greater awareness and promote, uh, you know, the disclosure process by trying to bring in as many people as possible. And one of the ways, you know, that we felt we could do that was to simply bring in the diversity of thought and the, you know, the wide ranging views and the people from, you know, Ireland and India and Latin America, South America. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, I think we accomplished the mission. Just thinking out loud here, and this this isn't meant to come across as dismissive to the people who are in the citizens groups, because I'm trying to reach out to some of them actually to get them on the podcast. Do you feel there's an element, maybe looking back in hindsight, and I don't know if this is something maybe for the future, that it's a little bit like having, with so many of those bigger names, people expected one thing, but really, and I don't think this is unfair or, or necessarily a bad thing, this was about a grassroots movement and a, a call to action mm -hmm. and it's about awareness. It was a bit like having the Super Bowl halftime show with Eminem, Dr. Dre and Missy Elliott and all those at a kid's Little League game because you've got these unknown names who are doing a yeah. lot of really hard work, very difficult work at a grassroots level. Yeah. And maybe people expected big disclosure type announcements because you had Neil Elizondo Coulter. But once they were out of the way, you had you had the kind of the, the lesser known names talking yeah. about in very short bites as well. Like you say, it was difficult to put it across in such short snaps. The work they're doing, how people can get involved, what they want to do. Um and like I say, I hope that doesn't come across as disparaging, but it just seemed like maybe almost there were two different events in one. And is that something you would talk on? And what could you learn from that going forward? I think that's a fair point. And, you know, we went through sort of <clears throat> what we call the run of show, which is sort of the roster and the lineup and, you know, who was going to speak when. And it went through many, 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 many iterations where, you know, we would have sort of the so-called big name, and then we'd have a series of, of uh, you know, like you said, like the lesser known names or people that are not as uh, prominent in, you know, the disclosure field or the transparency UFO field. Um, and eventually this sort of became um, the idea that we would have sort of more like, you know, portions of the Global Disclosure Day. So we had, you know, at the beginning, we have Ross Coulthart and Luella Sondo and Carl Nell and Tim Burchett and others, you know, speaking very specifically about, you know, what's going on with disclosure and, and then also, you know, putting a very hard push there that people need to get, you know, engaged and, uh, you know, sort of make disclosure happen. And then we moved on to, you know, the partnerships that we have with people that are, you know, also working in this field, like Lester Mary from UAP caucus and Nicole from Declassify UAP. Um, and then moving on to, you know, the people that are actually there on the ground, you know, implementing all of the ideas from, you know, Lester Mayor and, um, and, and NPI and these sorts of things that are actually, you know, actively engaged. So it became sort of, uh, you know, progr programmatic in that way. Um, but there, you know, there had been great consideration into, you know, the lineup of who was going to go and, and when, and some of that was logistical in terms of, you know, there were a couple of recordings that we had to have because they couldn't go live. And then other instances where people would be sitting in the green room for, you know, a couple of hours, you know, waiting, you know, virtually behind, you know, backstage. And so, you know, trying to coordinate all these various people, you know, into the lineup and, and get them, you know, uh, you know, lined up and things was, you know, trouble problematic too. So, um, but I think it's a fair criticism to say that it was front loaded um, and didn't, 
you know, if we had had, you know, an El Elizondo or something more towards the end, you know, maybe more people would have stuck around, but, you know, it was three hour, three hours plus. Um, so, but I think there's definitely lessons to be learned from, you know, the entire process and, you know, how to, you know, structure it again in the future and, you know, planning out, you know, how many people are speaking, how long they're speaking and that sort of thing. There's always lessons to be learned. Yeah, and and fair it's fair props as well to to the running of it because for doing that sort of thing for a first time, I felt there were surprisingly few technical hiccups, given yeah. the breadth of what you were trying to do, the number of people involved, and not to say it was perfect, but I've seen that sort of thing happen on TV shows with multi million dollar budgets <laughs> and run much worse than that. So right. so well done to the folks involved from a technical point of view as well. Um, yeah, well if I could just real quick then is to give a yeah. shout out to a fellow named Georg Bosch who lives in Germany, who was sort of doing all the technical work behind the scenes. And you know, all the credit goes to him for, you know, running a fairly smooth um, you know, uh live stream there. We had people coming in from you know, different parts of the world, you know, many different time zones, uh, making sure it all went off as, you know, well as could be, you know, there was a couple, a couple of glitches here and there, but that was sometimes user error in terms of knowing whether they were actually live, they're on camera, you know, audio, now, those sorts of things are really difficult to, to, to not have happen. So, but, you know, all the credit goes to, to Georg for that. Yeah, absolutely. But well done uh, on, on running that. And hello to Victor, who uh, I think had a couple of seconds at the start. I know some yeah. folks on Discord were like, there's That's no right. audio, Victor's having a mare, but he got there. <laughs> yeah. So well, well done. Um, yeah. And I should also, and I should also, you know, make note that we have some videos of other people uh, that were going to speak that uh, didn't end up making it in, into the stream because, you know, we were running so far behind. We had people that were in the green room for a very long time waiting for their turn. And, you know, like you said, it was already, you know, three plus hours. And so we just decided to, you know, cut out a couple of those videos so we could get to the live people. So part of the process of, as I think you, you noted at the beginning here, um, you know, the live stream has been taken down. It's going into post-production, you know, and all those videos and things we put back in uh, so people can see them as they were originally intended. Um, you mentioned, and I'm going to probably have to ask you to speak on behalf of other folks here, just because it, it wasn't your role as such, but the what was the initial audience that was this was aimed at because what it seems uh, and uh, i suppose was go always going to happen is it's been the ufo community which has seen it looked at it listened to it and largely on mass i'm sure a few other eyes and ears were on it but was the idea that this goes out to an audience that isn't all clued up on the ufo topic on uap um because it seemed that's what it was aimed at but i'm guessing given they want this to be an annual event. There's going mm -hmm. to have to be something that that changes that it's it's for an audience that isn't necessarily UFO friendly or UFO centric already. Yeah. So um, obviously, to some extent, it's sort of geared towards uh, the audience that's already primed for it. You know, people that are in ufology, activists, people that have a even some people that have a passing interest and like to watch the podcasts and that sort of thing. But at the same time. You know, as NPI grows, as it expands its citizens for disclosure, grassroots advocacy, you know, it all sort of filters down and out in that way. And it becomes part of the public education process. So to some extent, you know, when you have, you know, Ross Coldhart talk, he's already talking past those people who have very little familiarity with the issue. So it, to that extent, you know, that's not really the audience. But at the same time, you know, we're slowly trying to bring you know, the public up to speed on the issues so to become more well-informed so that by the time they do get to Global Disclosure Day, you know, they're going to know exactly what we're all talking about. But, you know, at the same time, trying to bring those new people in. Do you know, I think then if, if the idea for it being aimed at the UFO community, and I'm thinking of someone here, you know, Joe Q public like myself, who just has an interest in UFOs, clearly, I, I was maybe unaware that the, the overarching theme here was going to be let's really push the citizens for disclosure let's that's going to be the big call out i think that's a totally fair one as well i suppose as an argument especially from a pr point of view does that does that bring in people to watch and listen if you say we're going to have loads of citizens for disclosure groups on to talk about you know getting local chapters international chapters as well which i think was wonderful to see that as part of it and completely necessary whereas you had a lot of folks talking about the UFO subject. And like you say, 
some folks maybe expected bombshell disclosure announcements. I think we got some some news from it at the start, but yeah. could there be a sharpening up of that message to say, look, what we really want from this is folks getting involved. You can see in Albuquerque and in Hong Kong and these various different places, Ireland, England, there are people who are just ordinary members of the public looking to help out get involved, do even little bits and pieces. It could be it could be going and posting letters, you know, it could be something as small as that, but it really can make a difference. Maybe that sort of messaging could be strengthened if that's the real purpose of it. Yeah, sure. I think that makes sense. Um, you know, sometimes when you're when you write an article uh and you're you're your own editor, you're gonna miss, you know, a few things. So I think some of these, you know, these criticisms or critiques are, you know, certainly valid and, and uh, good for us to think about, you know, in the future. And I think that, you know, as we sort of advertised uh, the Global Disclosure Day, you know, we we were talking about Citizens for Disclosure, uh, Global Disclosure Day and Citizens for Disclosure. And that, you know, that we have, you know, people in about 43 states, you know, that are that are now active, you know, on the ground. We have about nine or 10 of those states where there's actual, you know, formed groups that are, you know, beginning to be, you know, active in the communities. You know, we anticipate that by the time we get to the the next election in 2026, that you know that we're going to be in you know all 50 states, you know, hopefully all 435, you know, congressional districts, and we're going to have people on the ground, you know, making this you know into a real political issue that um, you know politicians have to pay attention to, and so that's sort of you know was sort of the messaging behind you know even in the advertising and the public relations of you know Global Disclosure Day. I mean, it was talked about in the press release. It was on you know, the top paragraph of uh, the homepage or the landing page for for Global Disclosure Day. So I think if, you know, if people um, were surprised by that, then that's certainly something that we'll have to take a look at and figure out how to do a better job of messaging that for sure. It's difficult to do anyway, because even in the next couple of weeks, there's a quite a lot of UFO documentaries coming out and you're talking, mm -hmm. you know, kind of platforms like Netflix, um, there's a George Knapp documentary coming out. There is MGM Plus on the 27th of October has a new series called Beyond with all the big UFO names in it that you would expect. Um, and when I shared some of that stuff online, the reaction from a lot of folks, well, I'll say mixed. You had half who were excited to see new content and half who said same old, same old, same names, same stories. So that's a really difficult one to, to balance because really... Mm -hmm those documentaries aren't aimed at the ufo community as such they're for people who are to get them into the subject get them inure to the topic i think um not that there's not people in the ufo community that aren't happy to see these i i certainly am but i get there's a a balancing act to be done again i think i've used that phrase a few times so so regarding the event you've had now and i appreciate it's kind of a hot take because it's like i say hours after it's happened what are your immediate thoughts, again, from a PR media point of view, that we will definitely take these going forward and for next year, for the second annual event, these will be there? And is there anything you're thinking already, we we should introduce this or we should change this? Uh, well, first, if I could go back to sort of the Netflix MGM thing and, uh, you know, uh, Fox is the program coming out. So, you know, I think that what we should look at when it comes to Netflix documentary with uh, George Knapp and the MGM stuff is uh, take it for what it is, which is that there are more uh, media outlets, um, even if it's sort of entertainment, but docuseries, whatever, that they're you know taking the, the subject more seriously and they're putting out more content. And so it may not be geared for the people who are you know really well informed on the subject matter, but it is raising the awareness out there amongst other people who you know may not have or may not pay attention to the issue at all but they're sitting around on a weekend and looking for something to binge watch and they stumble upon that and then they go off on their own investigation to start learning about what you know what is george knapp talking about what's going on here right yeah. so um you know i think there's great benefit to to this stuff even if it's um not at sort of the the level in terms of information that people who are well steeped in the subject, even if it doesn't sort of satisfy their needs, it is satisfying, you know, another need that's out there. So um, I forgot what the second point of your thing was. I think it was about what our plans are for Global Disclosure Day 2025. Uh, we yeah. haven't had a conversation about, about that yet. Um, like you said, you know, this was just hours ago, but, uh, you know, I will be having a meeting with 
NPI uh, pretty much as soon as we get off this podcast here and we'll be having those discussions, you know, we'll have, you know, a, a debrief about, you know, what worked, what didn't work and, uh, you know, taking in some of the critiques that people have offered and, you know, start thinking about that. And when the time comes to start planning that, then I'm sure that we're going to, you know, revamp it and make some changes and, you know, try to keep what really worked and then, you know, try to correct some of the things that didn't work so well. So that's all I can say about it. Because like I said, you know, it just it literally just happened. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll echo what you said about the content coming from MGM Plus, from Netflix, from these types of organizations, because one, you don't have to watch it and no one's forcing you to watch it. But like you say, there's a whole audience out there who don't know this or even from my point of view, I think you can get lost in this topic sometimes when you you are so involved. You forget stuff happened. You forget the timeline of things. You go back and it can be even be small comments, quotes, little little happenings. You go, oh God, I forgot that was even a thing. And right. these, these documentaries kind of bring that back to the forefront. And with the program that you mentioned quite rightly coming out pretty soon, and we would hope, I know James Fox, again, Kevin Wright, as we hit record, James Fox has posted an update to say he's in LA tomorrow, which will be the 22nd of October. Um, and a load of meetings with major services hoping to get something confirmed for this to be launched soon Great. and for, from James's point of view all, all the best because I know as a family man he puts in a lot of work and time into these documentaries and hopefully he gets some money back on these as well because I know he got shafted previously yeah. um, from his, his previous work um, but yeah I, I suppose again asking just going back to the question I asked and I totally appreciate you're going to take things forward was there anything from your expertise as you were watching the live stream you you immediately thought this is working really well and conversely anything you thought that needs to change um i'll be honest not really because to some extent i didn't watch you know part portions of you know the live stream because it's doing other things um so i need to to, to you know re-watch it when it goes through post-production and and, uh, and all that but um, like I said, you know, I think that there were a lot of things that worked r really very well about it. The, you know, the technical aspects of it, I think went off, um, you know, quite well. It could have been a disaster. We could have lost internet connections. We could have, yeah. you know, not had the webinar working properly. I mean, there are any kinds of things that could have, that could have happened that would have been outside of our control. Those things didn't happen. Um, you know, we had a very good roster of speakers, um, but you know, I think there are some of the critiques, like you said, that you know maybe staggering some of the uh, some of the speakers in a different sort of way, making it a little more clear to the audience that Global Disclosure Day isn't uh, about um, you know all the bombshells and you know letting people know it's uh, you know the latest or something like that. So I think we could take all those things into consideration, you know, moving forward. But honestly, just hasn't really been enough time to just sort of digest um, you know all the ins and outs of of, of what happened. And I'm sure after something like this, the last thing you you want or need, or maybe you do, is a load of folk coming at you and telling you, this is what I would have done, this is what I would have <laughs> done. The answer to that is almost always, well, go and do one yourself. And especially me on this platform, you'd be quite right to turn around and say, Andy, <laughs> go and do one yourself. But I'll leave that to the experts. Yeah, like no, no, no. I, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's extremely valuable right now because it's fresh in your mind and it's fresh in, you know, the minds of the people that just watched it. Um, and those initial impressions are, are very important because, you know, once it goes back up, uh, you know, on YouTube sometime later this week, you know, um, watching it a second time or a third time or whatever, you're going to get different things from it. But the initial sort of reaction is probably one of the most important because, you know, it's more raw and it's emotional and you can get more value out of that rather than, you know, going through and, and picking it apart, you know, frame by frame, you know, over and over and over again. So I think this is you know, uh, timely that we're having this conversation and uh, thankful for all the feedback, whether, you know, people really liked it or they didn't like it, you know, we'll take, you know, we'll take, um, you know, value from all the comments. So. Awesome. Um, I'll share then from the Discord chat, which is always a lively place. And I think the Discord chat for this podcast is a, a nice safe haven away from the social media x twitter world that can be a bit <laughs> right. hectic at times not yeah. that it's not a bit raucous and whatnot but people are generally pretty switched on and i would say a lot of folks in there are quite grounded in the ufo conversation they can embrace the woo and the more out there aspects of it but 
they're, they're pretty ordinary folks looking to talk about UFOs. Um, and I know the feedback from most of them uh, would be ditch the music videos in between. They weren't. And I think from their point of view, to make a really serious point of that, the, the feeling was, and I like the way they think about this, because this is the way I think about it. And we're all precious or protective of the UFO topic. Mm -hmm. If this was a group of my friends, I managed to get around my house who had no interest in UFOs and we put it on the TV. There's a lot of stuff I would be happy with them watching. Most of the citizen stuff, I'd be like, there's your normal folk doing really good work and interested in UFOs. You can like them or not, but they're interested in the same subject I am. Yeah. Same with Lou Elizondo, Ross Coulter, Carl Nell, all these folks talking about the UFO topic. You can believe they're crazy or making stuff up if you're not into it. That's fine. But you can then back up. Here's what they're saying. Here's why they're saying it. Um, and they're, they're credible folks with credible backgrounds. So, again, you can have that conversation. The music stuff, though, I think came across a little bit cheesy. And it was sure. like... I, I think you're referring to, to the video that played it towards the very end there. The there was two. The there was, I think Ron James had put one in that was aimed at whistleblowers oh. or something. And Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I... Didn't, I I was able, I saw it on screen, but I didn't, I wasn't able to hear it. Um, yeah. So I'll have to go, that's one of those things I'll have to go back and listen to. But uh, I, I might be in the, the 1%, Kevin. I, I <laughs> mean, with the folk in the Discord, but just the general consensus was that. Yeah. But. No, I think that's, you know, those, those are fair criticisms too. And then we'll, you know, we'll take those into account and think about it. Um, the, the video that I thought you were referring to was the one that was, you know, right at the very end there. And that was yeah. something that was sort of like a very last minute decision. Um, you know, it was, uh, made by somebody in the in the citizens for disclosure community, yeah. um, so we felt that it was inclusive of you know doing something that one of our members did, um, and you know if it if it didn't land right, then we'll certainly take into consideration you know not doing that in the future. Um, we also thought it was kind of very clever because it brought in you know a lot of the speakers. You know, it mentioned Ross Coldheart. You know, it mentioned uh, Luel Zondo and others. So we thought it was you know. Um, you know, appropriate, but it, you know, we'll take into account what you know what people thought about it and you know make decisions moving forward. And no harm to them, and that's not me. And I know that was from one of the individuals either, but yeah, no, it's um, a, it's a fair you know it's a fair thing to you know to take a look at that. I mean, you know, you want to have the best production that you can, and um, like I said, you know, I haven't really given it much thought, but uh, you know, we appreciate you know your your audience um, you know bringing it up, and you know we'll have discussions about it. Kevin, just before we get to some listener questions, and there was loads of them sent in at really short notice, so thank you. Um, something you said in your own your own piece within the event was yeah. it feels within the UFO topic we can take a few steps steps forward, and then we go steps back, and that's mm -hmm. very very fair. Um, across the whole the whole topic, yeah. How many? Where are we right now? Do you think in the overall conversation, and how many more kind of steps forward do you think there are? Oh, geez. Um. Sometimes I guess when you're sort of like in the in, in the midst of it, it's kind of hard to hard to see exactly where you're at. You know, you're in the dark woods and, um, you know, uh, you're trying to find the light at the end of the tunnel. I think that, you know, we continue to make progress. You know, part, one of the things I do is I, I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill meeting with, uh, you know, the offices of members of Congress and the House and Senate. And, um, you know, it's all very receptive. Some members and, and their staff are much more knowledgeable about the subject matter than others. Um, and that's evident when you go to, you know, talk to people that are like, say, on the House Oversight Committee. You know, they're much more informed on the subject because of, you know, their role in the hearing last year with David Grush and Commander Fravor and things and, and Ryan Graves. Um, and then you step outside and you go to, you know, meet other member that's on, say, the Transportation Committee. And they may not have very much, you know, knowledge base of the, of the issue at all, except for the fact that, you know, that there was a hearing last year and, you know, maybe there's some some legislation that's being, um, you know, shuttled around on Capitol Hill when it was Ryan Graves's, um, you know, Air, uh, Americans for Safe Aerospace uh, Act, um, whatever, whatever that was called, I forget what it was off the top of my head. But, you know, I've had conversations with members about that as well. But, um Part of the whole idea is to meet with as many members and their staff as possible to sort of raise their awareness as well, too. And, you know, not to have any sort of specific ask about doing anything in particular at this moment in time, but coming, you know, into the next legislation or next legislative session that will begin in January, that we're going to be coming back and having more conversations and talking about, you know, legislative priorities and this sort of thing. But 
to get to that point, you have to get them more up to speed. And that's not just members of Congress, but also the staff, because the staff do, you know, so much work behind the scenes in preparing, you know, their, their members on so many different issues that they have to, you know, sort of keep, you know, um, you know, all sort of, uh, you know, together because there's so many of them going on <clears throat> that I think that, you know, so there, there's that sort of work that's being done. And so that's progress. It's not measurable because the public, you know, the public doesn't see it. And, you know, the, the community doesn't really see it because, you know, they, they have their own lives, their own jobs and their own things that they're doing and they're paying attention to the podcasts and things. So it's not something that's, you know, going on, you know, very visibly. And then you obviously also have you know, per, people working behind the scenes, you know, talking to members of Congress uh, who are whistleblowers, who uh, who are not public yet, of course, um, and may never be. I mean, it depends upon whether or not we're going to be able to get enhanced whistleblower protections, you know, something that uh, Dana Sheehan and NPI has been, you know, engaged on. Um, you know, there's probably also other pieces of legislation that will come up in the new year, um, some of which I think that, uh, you know, NPI will be working on. Uh, in conjunction with other members of Congress, you know, to sort of push this ball down the field. And it's going to take a concerted effort of, you know, working with as many people in Congress as possible. You know, I think that part of the mistake early on was people going only to, you know, the Timber, the Tim Burchettes and the Nancy Maces and those things. And they're they're very critical and valuable um, you know, figures in the movement on Capitol Hill, but we've really got to sort of broaden out you know, that activism to get more members of Congress aware so that they're also starting to take interest and get engaged on these on these, you know, pieces of legislation that, that are coming up, whether that's, you know, another, uh, you know, another attempt at the UAPDA or something else. Um, so I think that there's a lot going on behind the scenes and it's not even behind the scenes. It's just not being really sort of talked about. Right. But so I think there's a lot going on. So there's steps that have been, you know, that continue to be moving forward um it's just sometimes there's something that happens you know in a much more public way with like the national archives and extending to september 30th 2025 the fact that mm. you know all these agencies and departments of government who have uap responsive records that they have this extension of time to turn them over um so that's definitely a couple steps back but at the same time there's lots of other steps being taken that just you know might not be as visible as you know a piece of legislation that's been enacted and signed into law by the president no very well said well put um, let's get to some listener questions then, which cover some aspects of what we've said and kind of expands on a few things as well, Kevin. Um, Dave Smether said, a great event, I thought very inspiring. As Jay Fessler observed on Twitter or X, I felt there was more than a little catastrophic disclosure on the new Paradigm Institute's Global UAP Day. Um, Carl Nell's anti-gravity discussion, Coulthard bringing craft down, Danny Sheehan's large underwater base. Was this a shot across the bows by NPI? I hope so. Um, well, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, I didn't know what people were going to say ahead of time. You know, so I don't think that there was any sort of planned coordination in terms of, you know, what Ross was going to say. And then you know, Carl's going to follow it up and then Danny's going to follow that up with all these, you know, um, statements. So I don't think it was, it was necessarily planned in that way. I just happen to think that it's sort of just, that's the way it played out. I hope that's, I hope that's a good answer. Yeah, no, it is. And listen, <laughs> Kevin, I'm very wary. I've maybe came across as, as more on the critical side on this. I could have sat here and gave you all the props and I've tried to do it where I can. Uh, I think being Scottish, I'm naturally more negative <laughs> than positive anyway. Um, but it's honestly, probably the, the weather. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I live in England and it's crap anyway. And just you know, <laughs> the UK is just rubbish. Um, but here we are. But there was a lot of great stuff, especially at the start, because and that's what I think if that had been spread throughout and you kind of got those bites, wow, wow, wow. But yeah, I can see why Dave thought that, but like you see, it was more happenstance that yeah. all those kind of conversations came really early on and to get that level of level of hype and just a few minute segments from each person as well is pretty fantastic so so dave really enjoyed that um well so I'm, I'm glad, but like i said you know, i think it was just sort of you know by happenstance it wasn't anything that was planned in that way so no, brilliant. Um, Jeff says, now, a few days ago, Jim Garrison spoke to Andy and mentioned that the NPI favours a Truth and Reconciliation Commission type of approach so that everything can come out. Is the new Paradigm Institute in favour of a controlled disclosure over several years? Um, 
What I would say is that the New Paradigm Institute supports the UAP Disclosure Act. And the UAP Disclosure Act clearly outlines a controlled disclosure plan um, that would take, you know, a, a couple of years to accomplish, you know, three, five, I don't know what the, the number is, but, you know, mm. a, a number of years, because it's not as though, um, you know, the, I th use the National Archives as sort of an example, you know, the, the government, gave the act gave government agencies and, de and departments 300 days to turn over the documents right to, to collect them review them and turn them over to the national archives it's now been kicked down the road by 11 months or so at the same time there's no real enforcement mechanism inside that legislation to compel agencies and departments to actually turn over documents so we're never going to know what documents are you know remain behind uh you know the the iron curtain of, of secrecy here so that's why you know the UAPDA was so important or is so important is because it would have given it would have created the UAP uh, review board and they would have been given subpoena power and they would have done their own investigation into this uh, to ferret out all of the hidden information to make sure that you know no stone got left unturned. So that will take time. It's not as though you pass the act and then all of a sudden you know the review board pops into existence and it, it's fully staffed and they're. Yeah start getting all the documents and then they're like, okay, we have all the documents here, you know, come inspect it on the, on the conference table. You know, it's just not realistic. So um, it is a, it is a process that would take time. Um, and, and that was a process that would have, you know, real teeth, enforcement mechanisms, subpoena power, and those sorts of things. Whereas what passed in the uh, NDA fiscal year 2024, you know, there is no real enforcement mechanism. There's nothing there to actually compel agencies and departments uh, of the executive branch to turn over these documents. So um, I guess basically to answer your question, then yes, the, you know, the New Paradigm Institute does does support a controlled disclosure uh, campaign sort of outlined like, you know, the UAPDA does. Just to expand on that still from Jeff, he says, if that is the case, what type of information does Kevin feel may need to be held back early on from, you know, we the people? Um, well, speaking for myself, you know, I, I do think that there are national security concerns that we should take into consideration. Um, you know, if uh, I, I think we should divulge as much as as possible, you know, in a responsible way that doesn't compromise national security. And that doesn't I'm not when I say national security, I'm not referring necessarily to, you know, criminal or civil liability or something like that. All that stuff should come out. What should not come out potentially is, you know, have we developed um, you know, a weapons platform or weapon system that we don't want our adversaries to know about. You know, I don't think that should probably become public because that would certainly be damaging to our national security to let a China or Russia or North Korea know, you know, what our capabilities are in the event that, you know, we face the unfortunate scenario where we do have to go to war with one of these countries. We don't want them to know what we have. So under that circumstance, I think it's plenty reasonable to say that, you know, something like that should not be disclosed. But I think sad. largely everything else should. No, that that's fair. But it is sad, isn't it, to think that in that disclosure type scenario, we're still looking at the realistic conversation around we can't talk about this elements of this because of weaponry, potential war scenarios. When I think in a lot of the movies or or kind of blue sky thinking over the years, it's something that brings the world together for one reason or another. See Independence Day or you know other movies where things go a little bit nicer for humanity. Right. But you're probably still looking at, well, Russia coming out, China coming out and saying, yeah, well, we know this is true as well. And then they potentially have those conversations publicly. Does that draw the US into a conversation? And here we are, humanity's finally found out we're not alone, but we're still on the brink of total annihilation. And probably all of a sudden, not from thermonuclear weapons, but from high energy weaponry, from these exotic craft that were, were back engineered from decades before. So it's a probably a sad state of affairs. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, part of that could be, you know, uh, part of the catastrophic disclosure scenario. I mean, I think there's probably different ways that catastrophic scenario, catastrophic disclosure could happen, right? Um, obviously, one is that uh, whoever it is or whatever it is that's out there, you know, makes their, their selves known in a way that, um, you know, really damages, you know, government, society, uh, humanity, etc. But there's also, you know, ways that catastrophic disclosure could happen, 
in conjunction to what we were just talking about with national security concerns and weapon platforms and this sort of thing of, you know, imagine a, uh, you know, a China um, decides to invade a Taiwan and has a first strike capability of, you know, of a, a reverse engineered UFO that um, we have no defense against. That would be sort of catastrophic disclosure because we'd have to be able to explain how it is that, you know, China developed something of that magnitude, how we didn't know about it, and why weren't we, you know, doing the same thing? And, you know, that in itself would be sort of a catastrophic disclosure in terms mm. of, you know, the, the survival of our country, uh, what that means geopolitically for, you know, the influence of China and bringing people into their orbit because of their advanced technology, their advanced knowledge of, uh, you know, NHI or whatever the case may be. So there's a number of ways that the, the catastrophic disclosure could occur. And that's certainly one of those sorts of types of scenarios. Um, that I think people should be very concerned about and that the government should get out in front of if they do have some of these technologies so that it isn't a um, situation where we are surprised technologically by the advancement of, of a China or something like that, where they have these these capabilities that, you know, renders our defenses you know, useless. That'd be catastrophic. So what's the idea then or likelihood that if the US did disclose in any way, shape or form officially, properly, you could panic a China into some kind of action? Uh, I have no idea because, I mean, you know, I'm not uh, in any position to know exactly what the capabilities are of China. Um, you know, I assume, you know, you read the same reports that I do that China and Russia in particular have you know been pursuing the same uh, programs that the United States uh, apparently is engaged in? Um, you know, I, I can't remember who it is that just recently talked about it, but you know, it's talked about how you know China has sort of an advantage in this in this case if they're also you know sort of on par with our uh, research and you know reverse engineering because they don't have the various stovepipes um that apparently that we do where mm. you know a technology has been sequestered you know into the basement of some defense contractor and then they're sort of left alone to sort of try to figure out what it is how it works you know how to reverse engineer it and it's you know kept out of you know the scientific sort of study and you know in conjunction with other corporations other universities other scientists whereas you know a, a china doesn't have that problem because you know it's all collective it's for the state so you know, obviously it's very top secret and, and things there too, but, you know, they have a, an, an advantage in that in that scenario. Uh, another question from Paul. I won't read because we've discussed it in the body of the interview. So, Paul, I think you'll appreciate that's been answered. Thank you for sending that in. Um, Invisible College asks, there oh. appears to be both pro and anti UFO journalists at the New York Times. How will the new Paradigm Institute go about getting another good faith story on the front page and sidestep the gatekeepers? Appreciate this mm -hmm. might not be NPI's direct remit to get the story there, but I am sure given the folks involved, given the expertise and what you can and can't do, that it's something you could certainly help with. Well, it's an interesting uh, question. It's not one that I, I'm, I'm certain that can be answered because, you know, I think there's a lot that goes into getting a story like this into the New York Times, <clears throat> you have to have something that is ironclad, um, you know, real evidence of something that you can go to, you know, the editor uh, of the paper with, uh, you know, another probably New York Times uh, writer, and then, you know, a Leslie Kane, Ralph Blumenthal type of scenario where they, you know, work together on a story, um, but it's gonna have to be something you know, extraordinarily blockbuster, I think, to get the New York Times to to write anything of any real significance at this point in time. Yeah, it's going to be a difficult one. Um, I personally think the next chance of something big like that in the New York Times will be if indeed this Immaculate Constellation story is going to blow up on the 13th of November at the hearings in a very public setting, then that would hopefully be enough for a New York Times editor to to okay any stories that may have already have been written and for the love of god i'm not hinting the stories have already been written before anyone gets in touch but i would think that if there was a story there certain journalists who are reputable and credible would have stuff ready to go potentially so fingers crossed folks um 
Art Solomon follows up with uh, the 20th of October should have been the 300 days passed for all companies that have materials in possession to release those to the National Archive. Understanding now that didn't happen and it's going to take another year, like you've already said, Kevin. Uh, Danny Sheehan said yesterday on the live stream that they won't wait for that. My question is, what will be the next move? I'm sorry, that who won't wait for that? I'm, I'm, I'm uh, the, uh, New Paradigm Institute. And I don't know if Danny was talking oh. more, you know, we as the people won't wait a year for, for something to happen. So I think they're looking at kind of what is that next move, but you might be having to speak on behalf of Danny here. Yeah, so what, what, I think, what I think he was probably referring to is the fact that, you know, we're not going to just sit around and wait for, you know, September 30th, 2025. Yeah. You know, this is a movement that, you know, is in operation every single day of the week, you know, that we are, you know, constantly in motion and that we're going to continue to push transparency and disclosure that we're not going to wait, you know, for that date to hope that the archives have some, you know, uh, good information to share with the public. You know, we're going to continue to, to, to push uh, forward and we're going to continue to support, uh, you know, legislation to continue to, you know, write some legislation to continue doing some of their calls to action where we, you know, ask the public to, you know, take our email program and send, you know, emails to members of Congress. Um, you know, MPI has already done like 38,500 emails, I think, to Congress over the last nine months or so. Um, you know, so we're going to continue to do, do that. We're going to continue to build citizens for disclosure, uh, you know, and get people, more people involved, like I said, you know, in, in all the states. So I think that's what he was referring to. Yeah, I think so. And Kevin, um, just to wrap up, because we're almost hitting the hour mark and you've been great sure. with your time. Really appreciate it, especially coming on so quickly after the event, folks. And, yeah. and Kevin wanted to come on and talk about it as quickly as possible as well. Um, and if folks want to send over feedback, if folks want to get in touch, Kevin, what's the best way they can do that? And also, um, I think you've said it'll be a couple of days, but how can they rewatch the event? Okay, so the best way to reach out to New Paradigm Institute would be go to newparadigminstitute.org. Um, and there's a number of, you know, call to action functions that you can do. One of them is join the Citizens for Disclosure uh, movement if you're inclined to, you know, want to participate in that. There's also, I think, probably a pop-up that we can sign up for the newsletter. And we get generally like two newsletters a week, one on Wednesday and one on Saturday. The one on Wednesday typically sort of does a recap of sort of, you know, relevant news uh, that's been going on in regards to UFOs and UAP. Um, and then the Saturday one, sort of has a theme, but it's usually in conjunction with, so I, I also write uh, a weekly column for the Roswell Daily Record. And so um, they allow us to republish that. It goes out in the newsletter. And then, uh, you know, Danny usually has something, a video or something else that sort of, you know, dovetails with the, the you know, the, the column or something like that. So that goes out. Um, so it's a good way to sort of stay up informed on, you know, what NPI is doing and that sort of thing. So that's what I would encourage people to do. And in terms of the rebroadcast of the Global Disclosure Day, um, I don't know exactly, but it will be within this week sometime. And I'm sure that, you know, once uh, it's ready and up on YouTube that, um, you know, we'll be posting on, on X and other social media platforms, you know, alerting people to the fact that it's, you know, been re reposted. And I'll put those links in the description as well, folks, for the NPI's YouTube channel and whatnot and the site for you to go and check those out. And from me, genuinely, please go and check out the stream when it's back up and running. I know it's really uh, tempting for a lot of folks with a busy life to to wait on podcasts or bloggers or, or X accounts or Instagram accounts to tell you what happened. But go and check these out. And I think especially when you see many of those citizens for disclosure groups and you see areas where you might be like, oh, that's where I live. That's where I'm from. I'm not far from there. Get involved because so many folks say they want to do more. How can they do it? or that they don't have any friends that are involved in the UFO topic and there's no one to talk to about right. the UFO topic. These are people in your area which are actively involved in the conversation. So I can't recommend enough to go and get involved because that's some of the very best work happening. In yeah, the and I think you'll, you'll, you'll also see that you know, a lot of these groups that are being stood up are forming you know, their own Citizens for Disclosure for like Southern California and they have their own Facebook pages, they have their own X accounts and, and things. And that's sort of a way to also start engaging you know, with some of these groups is finding the ones that are in your area now and start engaging with them, you know. Absolutely. Kevin, thank you very much for your time. It's been wonderful speaking with you. And well, thank, best you for of luck. thank you.
all for this episode thank you very much for tuning in don't forget to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform apple and spotify do make a huge difference to the algorithm if you're checking the show on youtube please don't forget to like and leave a comment on here as well any sharing you do is very much appreciated on any social media platform and finally you can listen to shows ad free and sponsor free in their glorious full versions by subscribing for less than the price of a coffee on apple spotify just search that at UFO Podcast Premium, YouTube, you can sign up and be a member, or you can do that through patreon.com. Thank you very much for listening, folks. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Folk. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more. Thank you.